Hello, and welcome to A Gross of Physics. Today is day 128, and what I'd like to do today is discuss how to calculate forces due to magnetic fields, and also discuss electromagnetism. Now, we've been talking about the right-hand rules, and that allows us to determine the direction of a magnetic field. We have right-hand rule one, which is a field around a wire, right-hand rule two, which is a solenoid, and right-hand rule three, A and B, which represent the force on a wire or the force on a single proton or electron. Now, the direction is one thing, and of course, since they're forces, they're vectors. The magnitude of the force is also important. And what we have are two equations that allow us to calculate them. Now, the force on a wire can be determined by the equation F equals BIL. Now, F is the force, and that's going to, of course, be measured in newtons. B is the magnetic field strength, which is Tesla's. I is the current flowing through the wire. And L is the length of the wire that's in the magnetic field. And that's why if we take a, um, a wire and we wrap it around something, we're placing more of the length within the field. So that means we can have a bigger force acting on it. So, bigger field strength, bigger force. Bigger current, bigger force. Bigger length of wire in the field, also bigger force. Now, of course, this has to be perpendicular. So the three things are going to be perpendicular. The force, the field, and the wire itself. If the wire is at an angle, what we're going to need to do is find the component of the wire that's perpendicular to the field and then determine it. That could be the length, typically, because the wire's length will be at an angle. So we're going to want to find the length of the wire that happens to be perpendicular. If we have it parallel to the field, there will be no force on the wire. And that means that it won't move. So we can use F equals bill in order to find the force on a wire within a magnetic field. On the other hand, if we want to find the value of the force on a charged particle in a field, we have a slightly different equation. And it's F equals QVB. Now, F, of course, is the force measured in newtons. Q is the charge of the particle. It could be a single proton, it could be a single electron, or it could be a combination of many electrons or protons. V is how fast it's moving through the field. And B, of course, is the magnetic field strength in Tesla. So you have Q, which is coulombs, V, which is meters per second, and finally B, which is Tesla's. And those combine to form a force as well. Now, once again, the charged particle has to be moving perpendicular to the field to experience the maximum force. If it's not moving perpendicular, we will find the component of the velocity that is perpendicular to the motion. So we may have to break legs in order to determine the value of the force. But to maximize it, we need to send it perpendicular to the magnetic field, and then we can find the maximum force uh, that can be exerted. So that means more charge will experience more force. A faster charge will experience more force, and if the charge is within a larger magnetic field, it will also experience a larger force. What we'll do is a few sample problems using the whiteboard in a little while. But what I want to do now is just discuss the fact that um, we have this concept called electromagnetism. And basically, what we can do is produce magnetic fields with moving electrons. We've done that with solenoids. We've talked about that already. We can also produce um, electric charge or current using a moving magnet. So the difference between the two is if we have um, mechanical to electrical energy, we call that um, a generator. And a generator is something that will take either mechanical energy, if I, if I were to crank it myself, or I could use some other method to spin it, that will then produce electricity. Turbines use this concept. Now, of course, you can have a small generator. Maybe you have a uh, flashlight that works by magnetic, uh, electromagnetic induction. Well, in that case, you probably have a little handle on the flashlight that you spin. And when you spin it, you're charging the battery inside the flashlight. And then when you let, when you let go, it's charged, and you could turn on the flashlight. On the other hand, um, what you would have is something that goes from electrical to mechanical, and we have a name for that. It's called a motor. 
So if we have energy conversion from mechanical to electrical, it's a generator. If we go the other way from electrical to mechanical, that's a motor. And this um, concept was discovered by Michael Faraday in 1831. So we're not going to get too um, involved with electromagnetism in this course. Um, taking more advanced physics courses, you will do more with um, generators and motors. But what's, what's important for our purposes is that you can convert magnetic um, field strength into electrical energy. And you can, you can go the opposite way as well. If you go from mechanical to electrical, that's called electromagnetic induction. And what you do is you store up or create a potential difference, um, a voltage, and then it'll push electrons through. That is the concept by which we use generators. Generators always have a magnetic field in them, and you spin either the magnetic field or wires around the field to store the charge. On the other hand, if we go from electrical to mechanical, that is going to be what we call a motor. And we use motors in many, um, many facets of our, of our everyday life, from fans um, with a computer or a fan for your, your home um, to anything that's, that's spinning. Many people have furnaces that will spin um, using a motor in order to send the, um, the hot water or maybe the air through the system. So motors are something that we use quite often um, in our everyday lives and generators are there to store or create electricity. And anytime you have electricity coming from the outlet, there's a generator somewhere producing that, um, that electrical energy. If it's a, a generator that you have, a, you know, a portable generator, because your power's out perhaps, it'll be on a small scale, um, usually using um, gasoline. On a larger scale, it could be a steam turbine um, at a power plant. It could be uh, using water. Um, it could even be using natural gas or some other type of material. It could be coal-fired. So then basically what we're doing is spinning a very big turbine to produce electricity. And that's a generator, generating electricity. And this all comes back to uh, Michael Faraday, who came up with this principle. So at this point, let's do some calculations when we, um, when we can uh, use the F equal bill and QVB equations. Um, but as far as conceptually, electromagnetism is when moving charges create magnetic fields or moving magnetic fields can create um, current, uh, potential difference, so therefore a current. If we actually had objects that were at absolute zero, you wouldn't have moving electrons within them and you would lose the magnetic properties. So the fact that electrons are charged and they constantly move in the atoms is one of the reasons why we're able to have magnets in the first place. So moving electrons produce magnetism and moving magnets can produce electricity. That's it for today. This is day 128. And let's take out the whiteboard now and do some sample problems. Thank you. Now there are two equations that I use for magnetic force and they really deal with right hand rules 3A and 3B. One of them represents the wire and one of them represents the charge. And each equation allows us to find the actual force on either the wire or the actual force on the charge within the magnetic field. And the wire is force equals BIL. And for the charge, it's QVB. Now, the force is F, obviously. And that's in Newtons. B is the magnetic field. And that's in Teslas. I, current. And that's in amperes. And L is the length of the wire in the field. And that's in meters. And the length of the wire in the field needs to be the section that's within the field that's perpendicular. What we can do is loop the wire, and then we'll have a stronger 
force because we have more length in the field. But this represents how much of it is perpendicular. Now for this one, F is force, and that's Newtons. Q is the charge, and that's in Coulombs. V is the speed, and that's in meters per second. And then obviously B is a magnetic field, and that's in Teslas. So we have two equations that will allow us to find the actual forces. Then we'll use our right hand rule with the flat hand to determine the direction. Now as we know, forces are vectors, so we need to worry about direction, and the right hand rule allows us to do that. In other cases, earlier in the course, it might have just been the direction of one of the quantities. But in this case, we're going to have to worry about the right-hand rules to determine it. And the, um, the current has to flow perpendicular to the field, and the speed has to be perpendicular to the field as well. If it's not perpendicular, there's no force. Now, if it's partially perpendicular, let's say the field is there, and I shoot it at an angle, let's say, or I have the wire at an angle, what we're going to have to do is find the component that's perpendicular. So we may need to use sine and cosine to find the perpendicular component. Most problems in the beginning, though, will be either perpendicular or parallel, just so we can work on the equations. Let's look at a sample problem for each now. All right, for this first one, what I want to do is take a wire that has a current of 30 milliamps, and it's 80 centimeters, and I'm going to place it perpendicular to the Earth's magnetic field. So I want to find the force on the wire. So the current, 30 milliamps. The length is 80 centimeters, and the magnetic field strength is 5 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. Now the equation is F equals BIL. So F equals 5 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla times 30 times 10 to the negative 3 amps times 0.8 meters. And I just have to multiply those three numbers together. I'll take my calculator and we'll calculate the value of the force. So 5E negative 5 times 30e negative 3 times 0.8. And the force on that wire is 1.2 times 10 to the negative 6 newtons. So if you are running current through a wire, and 30 milliamps is a standard current that could flow through a wire using a 6 volt or 9 volt battery, 80 centimeters is realistic in terms of the length of a wire. It doesn't have to be too long or short. But the point is, because the Earth's magnetic field is so weak, the force is pretty small. So you're not going to have wires in your house jumping up and down, even if you did have a much higher um, current flow. Let's, let's take this instead of doing 30. Let's assume it's right under the, the limit for your circuit breaker. So let's say it's 14 amps. Same magnetic field, same length. Well, if I just, in, instead of using the 30 times 10 to the negative 3, I do 5 E5, negative 5, times 14, which shouldn't trip the circuit breaker, times 0.8. I'm getting a force of 5.6 times 10 to the negative 4 newtons. Still not very large. So when you have current flowing through the wires in your house, not all of them are going to be perpendicular to the Earth's magnetic field, depending upon how they're oriented in the walls or on the ground, but it's going to be a very small force. So it's not going to have wires jumping up and down around your house. So that's how you would find the magnetic force of, uh, on a wire in, in the Earth's magnetic field. Let's look at one with a single charge next. Now we have a proton moving through a field, 
at 2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and the field strength is 0.4 Tesla. Now our equation is QVB. So force charge of a proton is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. The speed is 2 times 10 to the 8 and B is 0.4 Tesla. So all we have to do is multiply those three, 1.6 E negative 19 times 2 E8 times 0.4, and we have the force on the proton, which is 1.28 times 10 to the negative 11 Newtons. Not very significant either. If we had more charge, there'd be bigger force. If we had a bigger magnetic field, there'd be a bigger force. And if it was moving faster, although it must be in a particle accelerator already because it's moving pretty fast. But that's how we would find the force on a single charge. QVB. All right, before I mentioned that when we take a charged particle and move it through a field. For example, if it were a field that was into the page, what that's going to do is provide a centripetal force. And in this case, if I have the field in, I'm going to take my fingers, I'm going to point them to the right, my hand is slapping the page, and the force would be up. So what would happen is this proton would move in a circular pattern. Now, if the field were large enough, that proton could make a complete circle like this. Now, the radius of this can be found. And we have to remember that the force was centripetal. And it's also magnetic. So we have an equation for the centripetal force, and we have an equation for the magnetic force that we now know. Centripetal is mv squared over r, and the magnetic force on a charge was qvb. Now what we can do is solve for r. Cross multiply, we get mv squared equals qvb times r, and then divide both sides by qvb. So this cancels. And we're left with R equals MV, because one of the Vs will cancel, over QB. So if you want to find the radius of curvature, you need to know the mass. In this case, it would be the mass of the proton, how fast it's moving, the charge of the proton, and the magnetic field strength. And the way I remember this is if you want to find the radius, you need to move that quarterback. MV over QB. So that's how you would find the radius of curvature of a charged particle moving within a magnetic field. MV over QB.